This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. So today's idealist of the day from notepad.com, N-O-T-E-P-D.com, is the Doomsday Portfolio by Robin Altucher. And I have with me here Robin. Yes. Jay Paolo. Robin, why did you create the Doomsday Portfolio? I just had to do this research for my portfolio. So well, what, I just thought I'd it? share. Well, it's just, um, you know, I had to reposition a lot of stocks just to kind of, because of what's happening, you know, uh, with Russia and the Ukraine. And um, just did a little research on what the effects are going to be for the exports. See, I, I'm just curious. When you do this dome say portfolio, do you see it as long term, or do you see it like maybe like a couple of years after the war or tensions? And- that that's a great question. Because well, a couple of years, by the way, for most investors, is now considered long term. But right. the, the the question I had for Robin is is this very short term? Because what if? I mean, she writes in this. There's three scenarios. Scenario one: Russia takes over Ukraine, like their invasion succeeds for them and they take over Ukraine. Scenario two is Ukraine succeeds in fighting back and Russia gives up without forcing any concessions at all. And scenario three is, which is one I think we all, well, I guess scenario two also we all hope for, but scenario three is a deal is made and at the very least Ukraine agrees not to join NATO and Russia takes their military out and sanctions will be lifted. So I think that's probably, I don't know which scenario is likely actually. What do you guys think? Which scenario is likely? Or are there other scenarios? I... I, I don't know. I, I felt like I felt like the third one would be more likely. But isn't Ukraine uh, just apply for EU? They just applied for EU, and the EU agreed to kind of fast track them. But you right. can only fast track so fast. Like I right. think there's, and Paul might know there. There's something like 27 countries in the EU, and you have to basically work out trade agreements, right, with all of them. You have to integrate your banking system with the with the euro. Like it takes years to actually officially join, I believe. Plus there's like five countries, I think, ahead of them or something But I think like they're going to fast track Ukraine though. So what you're saying, it's not going to be end anytime soon then? It, it physically can't. Like like Brexit, I don't even know if England is fully out of the EU yet or if they did. It took them about three years to yeah, get out. Because it's, you, I can confirm it's fully out right now. <laughs> yeah, but but I believe at the end of 2020. But it took a long time. It took a crazy yeah, long time, right. like last year, like end of last year or something. Yeah. Wow. Right. It was time. like it was like a four or five year effort because you have to make new trade agreements with every European country because you're not you don't have the EU generic trade agreement with them. And I think the problem was there was it all boiled down in England and uh, uh, like Ireland and Scotland were having issues with England getting out of the Brexit. I Oh, because they had, I, I forget all the issues, but there were some, there were some weird trade agreement issues where like Northern Ireland was going to get screwed or something like that. Right. So I, I think I, I'm hoping for scenario, scenario three, but I think scenario one might be, maybe what's going to happen. Well, so, so, okay. And Paula, what do you think? You know, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I, I would think that I would guess either a some sort of deal is made right. or Russia takes over. Yeah, so same with me. Because, yeah, I kind uh, of, I, do you think, you, so So, do I, does anybody think Ukraine can hold them back long enough? Mm. I don't know. I mean, like for the past couple of days, like you see how many cities has been fallen and they took over the Chernobyl just like that. You know, but at the same time, Russia's morale is really low. Russian morale is really low. But at the same, but even even with low morale, it seems like they're still able to take the cities. Well, I, I guess we don't really, you know, I read articles that say there's low mor- morale, but we don't know if that's yeah, true or not. Who knows like, if that is true, right? It's uh, right. you don't know where the information comes from. Of course, people. Yeah, are and, and and look, exactly. even if those articles are spread with the best intentions in mind, like let's actually you know, create low morale for the Russian soldiers by saying they have low morale. That might be the reason that article is being spread, but we don't, right. we don't actually know. And the same thing, I do believe those cities have been taken over, but again, we don't know Ukraine's strategy. Like it could be, let's just throw the entire army at Kiev because 
until they get Kiev, they don't have the country. Right. You know, and also what Russia is about to find out is that, you know, this, this, what is there? There's something like, what is the population of Ukraine? I always have to look it up again. There's something like, um, okay, there's 44 million people in Ukraine and there's something like 200,000 soldiers that Russia has in Ukraine or on the border of Ukraine. And can they really, if the entire population hates you, can you really hold on to a country? I don't know. Um, unless you, you rule with the iron fist, uh, I guess you can't, right? I guess that's the fear is that, you know, once Putin is totally in charge, there's going to be, you know, mass murders, but I don't think the Russian people will go for that. It, it seems yeah. like it's like Russia and now I don't want to, uh, insult anyone, but it seems like Russia, Ukraine ethnically are the same as yeah. far as like, it's like England and Scotland. Like, do you yeah. consider like, do English people consider Scottish people a hundred percent different than them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, even know, but uh, I guess they, they have been at war in the past. But yes. my understanding is that the uh, there's a part of Ukraine which is ethnically Russian, and a yes. part yes. that is not. Right. right. So it's uh, that's the difference. There's a Russian-speaking population who feels uh, somewhat Russian, and there's a part that doesn't. So that's the, the difference. Yeah. So so that's an important part of what's going on in Ukraine right now. Is that starting in 2014, Russian the the, the Russian people who wanted to separate from Ukraine basically have been at war with the Ukrainians in those two regions. So, so it could be the case that a deal with Russia is they get those two regions and uh, Ukraine agrees not to join NATO. At the very minimum, I think that's what Russia would want in a deal. Well, that's still going to affect in trade with wheat and these things because I think they fall into that area. Yeah, and even if they don't, I mean, it, it's going to have Russia, you know, you never know if there's going to be, I think the, the problems you point out is that a, this war might not go well for Ukraine, in which case there's going to be all sorts of sanctions and so on against all these critical commodities, which we'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we'll talk about what stocks and investments can, can potentially benefit B, even if Russia backs out, but gets some concessions, you're never really going to be able to trust that right. Russia is not going to invade again or do some other things. And there's a third point here too, which is that, Ukraine's already been affected. Like they can't do a harvest this year if there are tanks on the roads, for instance, because they need, you know, farm equipment on the roads. Right. So that's going to so affect- So this year's, yeah. No, like, this year's like, done. Yeah, like they supply a lot of the wheat and grains in the world, both Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so so wheat prices have been soaring. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But also, I didn't know they, they also provide a lot of sunflower seeds and vegetable oils and uh yeah i uh, thought yeah i somehow i thought southern states are the one that provided all that like like florida or that's Michigan the florida orange something. juice commercial yeah. i don't know, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't think the u.s really provides a lot of anything we just kind of buy everything we do this is why we, our we trade deficit is so high also, do you know what so many people call it the Ukraine instead of just the Ukraine? Because it's not like you yeah, say, know. you know, <laughs> the Italy, you know, or the France. Right. Why, the why Ukraine, the everyone says that. I don't know. I know. That's weird. Yeah, like I, I just said that. So oh, you did? <laughs> probably. I've been trying, I, I've been trying to um, correct myself by saying Ukraine, but uh, so, okay, I'm not Robin, even claiming wanna... that it's wrong. Maybe it's right, but uh, it's, it's interesting that they would be, uh, the country's called that. First off, what, what was your point? Are these companies you think are investments for the long term or for the short term? Like before we say the investments, what could be the problem with owning uh, these investments? Well, I mean, this stuff I, I research, I've been researching it for a while. So a lot of it is pretty high if you buy it now. But I bought high. I don't typically do that. I just, for me personally, I feel that there's going to be a long term effect for all of these uh these commodities. So I'm just, even though they are high, I'm still going for them. So, well, well, it's interesting because, well, first off, it's what's interesting is they're high because, uh, since the invasion hedge funds have been obviously loading up on these, but what's interesting there is that they didn't start loading up. It seems until a few days ago. Right. So the next time there's a world crisis, it does seem that there will be an opportunity to load up. So it would have been good to make a list like this earlier, obviously, because the same yeah. information was available. But, you know, now I do think that 
these are are even though like wheat for instance is high it's it's a good long-term play because i was reading that the wheat harvest in ukraine best case is going to be about 30 percent lower than it was a year ago because of what's been going on now and worst case obviously it goes to zero so and on top of that and that's just ukraine yeah, well, not even that, to mention the seven percent from Russia or whatever. It oh, is. oh, yeah, that's right. Russia is a huge supplier of wheat. So, not to mention we hit an all-time high a year ago in April of 2021 because of high demand. So, like worldwide demand for wheat has been going up anyway, and now this will further hit supply. So, you know, essentially over the past year, it's up. Wheat, wheat as an example, is up fifty percent, but that's probably like probably not going lower anytime soon. It might go lower a little bit if this uh, scenario resolves peacefully, but it's in the long term. The demand is there and Ukraine and Russia are going to have supply problems for years to come after this because of sanctions, because of right. infrastructure being damaged from the invasion and and so on. So, uh, so okay, what's your, what's your first investment? So my first one is corn. I mean, I think all of these are important. Corn, wheat, uh, those are uh, both and, and, ETFs. Yeah, so corn is spelled C-O-R-N is the ticker symbol. It's an ETF mm -hmm. f that holds corn futures. Wheat, W-E-A-T, it's the ticker symbol, um, holds right. wheat futures. And and again, corn and wheat are, that is the biggest export of, it's 20% of Ukraine's exports. But what's interesting oh, wow. is that China is their largest buyer oh what from russia and and ukraine like a lot huh. by a lot so so that means china buys most of their most of the wheat that ukraine is selling um is going to china i believe that's what i saw or and you it's know, russia you know also between if you combine russia and ukraine yeah china that, that is 30 percent of total world wheat exports so if russia does succeed in either taking over Ukraine or causing huge supply chain issues for, for Ukraine combined with all these sanctions on Russia. I mean, that's 30% of a commodity or two commodities, corn and wheat that demand is, is, has been rising for. So that's, even if you're buying high right now, it seems like a, it's a good long-term play. So even Russia's trade, um, it is number one is, uh, China is their biggest. Yeah. Cause I guess U S doesn't necessarily buy those things, but U S no, we're number four. Yeah. But you know what though? Uh, it's tricky to think that way because you could say like, like with oil as an example, which is another thing you talk about on this list, just because the U S does not buy a lot of oil from Russia doesn't mm -hmm. mean we aren't affected because worldwide, you know, oil and corn and wheat, these are global commodities sure. and there's only one price for them. So right. it's the same price all over the world. So, just because of the China's the buyer, let's say from Russia, sure. and we're not as much a buyer, the price goes up, which affects you know all the citizens of the world for when right. oil prices go up or coin prices go up. So it affects it affects a lot of different things, but certainly the corn and wheat ETFs could go up regardless of the U.S. dependency on them. Talk about iron and and you know I didn't know Ukraine was a big iron exporter, but apparently they are. Yeah, so is Russia. Also, I'm curious, one of the items in the list, uh, not really the ideal list, but that table that she added is uh, ores, slag, and ash. What is ash? Like, I know what ash is, but it doesn't seem like a commodity to me. So ores, slag, and ash are all basically byproducts of the process of getting iron. Or I'll give you an example. We know this guy who his business was collecting garbage. And why did he collect garbage? Is because he would go through the garbage and find all the slag and ash, like all the kind of steel where he could extract iron from the steel and then uh, uh, sell it onto the commodities market. So it's kind of a byproduct of, I guess, the steel making process or the process of mining iron, one of those things. But the top importers, the top buyers of ores, slag and ash, it's a category where China, Japan, South Korea, Germany, and the Netherlands. So obviously these are all huge customers of Ukraine or Ukraine and Russia. And, uh, they're going to be, they're going to be greatly affected by this. And you use these things for anything that you need steel for. 
So for instance, car companies are in Germany and Japan, for instance, are not going to be able to get all the supplies they need, like the parts they need, because these things are made out of, you know, the ultimately iron. So this is where uh, the company Cleveland Cliffs comes in, CLF, ticker. Right. Yeah. Also, I didn't know this. I thought, so, so Ukraine is a big supplier of rare earth minerals as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, really? I thought, I thought India was. I didn't know they Ukraine are too. was. Oh. Yeah, China's the biggest, by the way. Well, and, that's because they took over Tibet and, and that area. Oh, yeah, because it's in the mountainous regions, right? Yes. Right. And, oh. and number two, like they didn't, you, you think about it, why would they take over Tibet? They don't really want to, they don't really care about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the right. Dalai they Lama just want or their, Buddhism. They wanted, right. yeah, the rare, earth, rare minerals. earth minerals. And that's why India also, because that's on the other side of the mountain. But by the way, I believe number two exporter is Greenland. And there's a company, uh, Greenland, I think it's called Greenland uh, Natural Resources or Green Ro Greenland yes. Mining Company. Yep. And China owns that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and so rare earth minerals, just so if people don't know, these are, as, they're, as it says in the name, they're rare. And they're, uh, that's why it's kind of important to know if, which countries sell them. And they're used in almost everything you do. Like they're used for batteries, they're used for semiconductors, they, they power the electric grid, like rare earth minerals. If we wanna have EVs, you know, electric vehicles, that's what we need. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, and any you, computer, any, yep. anything. Like iPhone, yeah. Yeah, so like if the world didn't have rare earth minerals, the, we would, the world, you could just shut the lights out. Now, I remember one time I had Naveen Jain on the podcast and he was starting oh, yeah. a space expo exploration company where his goal was to get to the moon because the moon is where there's, because the moon is not on earth. The moon, it turns out, has a lot of rare earth minerals. And so that was his goal was to find ultimately a cheaper way through space travel. I don't know. I don't ever know what happened to that company, but uh, in any case, in the US though, the only company that is mining and processing rare earth elements is MP Materials, MP. So I will look into that stock. These are not necessarily recommendations, just things to look at because the situation is so scary. And, and I do think, Robin, to your point, is that people are going to start looking to alternatives to, right. you know, it's not, it, we're not as global as we thought we were. Exactly. Yeah, we're too dependent on other country. I felt like, you know, that's a, that's a pro and con of, uh, of, uh, of globalizations, right? You, you, it's, you depend on other countries on certain things. Which right. we've been, we have a global economy, so we've been pretty yeah. good at that. And you know, and I'll just throw in one other thing, you know, lithium is used in every battery, but uh, a lot of uh, lithium comes from places like China and also lithium comes from Ukraine and Russia. Okay, but China owns 80% of all lithium right now in the world. Right, so if, if China is looking at this, you know, crisis to see how they're going to handle Taiwan, okay. it, it's about time we start weaning off of China for lithium that brings me to a, a point from yesterday that I was trying to find a pure play lithium company because we actually have like the largest in the U.S. in Nevada for a lithium, lithium mine. Uh, mine. Oh. And I found out yesterday that it's all owned by the Chinese. Oh. So they just come They're all like, Chinese hey. companies that are Canadian. And I researched these companies and they all, oh, it all, all of them went right to China. Mm. Okay, but there's one there's one company that owns a lot of land in Nevada where they have found lithium where uh so so most people don't know this, but Howard Hughes bought an enormous like hundreds of thousands of acres in Nevada back in the 60s because he was building he wanted to build casinos. He wanted to basically take over Las Vegas. And all that land was consolidated into, after he died into something called the Suma Corporation, which owns a big chunk of LTUM, uh, lit, the Lithium Corporation. And that is, I believe, an American pure play. I, I haven't researched that one yet. I didn't have Yeah, that, one, that one's an American pure play. Uh, you know, the Suma Corporation is a private company. It's all owned by Howard Hughes' family, like his distant cousins. And uh, I, I do, I, LTUM is a, is a pure play Lithium company here. It is weird though that you, another company called Lithium Americas just like Greenland Natural Resources yep. is is owned by China. Yeah, it's a Canadian company. So whenever you see a Canadian company, you need to really do your research. It typically, you follow the road to China. So 
any other points you want to make on this doomsday portfolio? I do think it's interesting to start for people to start analyzing, you know, what you do in different macro world scenarios. Like the, the greatest investors of all time, like George, George Soros, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, they always have a macro perspective on the world. Not as much Buffett, actually, more investors like Soros, but. Right. But macro as in like the, like what's a top level? Yeah. No, macro, like what's going on geopolitically. So like Buffett doesn't care as much. He looks for brands. He looks, he looks for things you can't necessarily predict. Like what's a brand that's going to be around 20 years from now. It's probably a good investment now. That's how he thinks about a lot of these things. He doesn't necessarily make daily investment decisions based on global politics, but George Soros, whatever anyone thinks of him is a successful investor. And he does think a lot about global politics. I just think that this is going to change a lot of people. Like with me, I feel like things that go through what I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people are thinking, and I want to support the pure plays, you know, like if I'm in France, I want to support the, you know, a French company, or if I'm in the U S I want to support a U.S. company. I think people are going to start to do that because that will, that'll help their countries. What is the definition of a pure play? Oh, one that's just owned by, uh, just purely, like say a French company, if you know, or purely a, a U.S. company, with no ties and no money coming from China or from Russia or from you know, other places. Okay, makes sense. The Canadians yes. have really brought in people from China. I mean, they've made trade deals with them, and they have for a long time. Uh, so most Canadian companies, I would say. You really look at them and, and, and take a deep dive into it because you'll be surprised. Well, because the U.S. has a lot of trade restrictions on, on China. And, and so, we, but, and this is how the world works really underneath all the rules and regulations is that everybody just winks at each other. So like when we put trade restrictions on China, a little bit of it is a wink because they go to Canada, which doesn't have the same trade restrictions on China. Right. Now we could have probably forced Canada to have the same restrictions, but we didn't because we still need these things that China provides. Right. So that, that's the issue. Like we don't necessarily, you know, refine lithium the way China does. And all our, all our electronic products like iPhones are made in China. So they, China needs lithium. So just recently there was a, a Canadian company that was uh, bought by the Chinese government, a lithium mining company, and Canada let them do it. It just blows my mind. Wait, so, I mean, if by the logic, so if we just buy whatever that China is buying, would, it, would we be making money? Well, they're just cornering the market. Well, right. well, no, again, though, they, they need lithium because they make iPhones, cars, you know, right, everything. But they don't they're... need 80% of the world's, you know, lithium well, right now. But to your point, Robin, they want to be not dependent on the rest of the world. So that's why they're kind of They smart. want the rest of the world to be dependent on them. Yeah. And this is what their play is and with wheat now. So this is what's so scary is that, you know, they'll bring us to our knees. Well, you know, the one thing is though, well, I guess th this is why China and Russia, we have to look at like what's happening in their relationships because China gets so many of their critical commodities from Russia and Ukraine. So this That's is why right. China doesn't necessarily bash this invasion. I mean, there's many reasons, but this is certainly one of them. Right. Uh, and by the way, if you're thinking about getting a new car, I'd probably try to get that new car now because certainly the price of a car is going to go up if, if iron and steel are going up. I should just move. I just should just move down to Georgia and buy a car right away. <laughs> you should you should do everything we suggest and then buy these yeah. stocks for your portfolio. <laughs> so, yes. uh, all right. Uh, the doomsday portfolio, we didn't list all the investments, but you can check it out at notepad, N-O-T-E-P-D dot com. And Robin Altucher is the author of that <laughs> idea list. Mm -hmm.